a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The guarantee of the Second Amendment to have weapons and to carry them. No other amendment comes close to provoking such contentious debate. Even the scope of the First Amendment has not been challenged as much. To some, the Second Amendment is a dangerous anachronism. To others, it's the promise that the source of all political power in America, the people, will have the means to defend themselves against all comers. America has more privately owned firearms than any other nation in the world. No other country even comes close. Current estimates on civilian gun ownership place the total count at between 265 million and 393 million guns, or between four and six guns for every five citizens. America also has a very high gun-related death rate per capita, with about 12 firearm-related deaths per 100,000 citizens, or 390,000 annually. The source of these figures is gunpolicy.org, which collected them from the University of Sydney in Australia, and yes, before you ask, I did round the numbers. There are citizens who would repeal the Second Amendment and strip every American of private gun ownership. There are other citizens who answer such demands with a quote from Leonidas of Sparta at the Battle of Thermopylae, Molan Labe, come and take them. There is a debate about what the Founding Fathers meant by well-regulated, militia, security, even whether the commas have any bearing upon the meaning and intent of the amendment. In short, it's a huge argument in America. So, when our society discusses issues politely with each side seeking a peaceful resolution, everyone benefits. When the discussion is a highly polarized shouting match between people who just don't listen to each other, well, it's time for some roasted opinions. Personally, I like hearing any bad news before I hear good news, so that is how we will look at the facts of the Second Amendment. Mass shootings, especially at schools and other public venues where there is a reasonable expectation of safety, occur in America. The expectation of security is based on laws passed to declare these spaces gun-free zones, which makes them particularly vulnerable targets. Whenever there is a mass shooting, every news outlet will report on it. Commentary begins before the evidence has been gathered and the people once again divide into ideological camps. The debate never ends. On the other hand, Americans who feel threatened can legally obtain a firearm with which they may defend their safety. Americans can also use firearms to hunt game within reasonable limits placed by the State Conservation Board. It's almost as easy to hunt for food as it is to fish for food. When the Constitutional Convention added the right to keep and bear arms as the Second Amendment to the Constitution, they meant to allow Americans to defend themselves and to hunt. There was another purpose though, and this purpose must be understood in its proper context in order to understand why the Second Amendment was introduced in the first place and why it is still just as important today. The purpose of the Second Amendment was to guarantee that the government could not take away the right of the people to defend their country against every threat, including the government if the need arose. Wait, what? You heard me folks. The purpose was to allow Americans to defend America against all comers. The evidence for this is found in the Declaration of Independence. The Second Continental Congress specifically listed the following abuses. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is, at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, Desolation and tyranny already begun with the circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country to become the executioners of their friends and brethren or to fall themselves by their hands. In short, King George III and his Prime Minister, Lord North, were enforcing the Acts of Parliament against Americans using armed force. The armies dispatched against the American colonies were not subject to local authority. Some of them were hired mercenaries with a distinct taste for plunder. 
The British Navy enforced British Mercantile Acts and royal monopolies on trade with warships, and manned those warships sometimes by impressing Americans. These were the acts against which the framers meant for the American people to be able to defend themselves, and they knew that a president could become as much of a tyrant as a king could be. Still, a better legal reason than to allow the people to depose an elected tyrant was provided. Militias are not organized, rather they are collections of every able-bodied man available. Those militias are neither subject to military jurisdiction nor dependent upon the government to provide them with firearms because of the Second Amendment. Yes, I realize that this is why the Confederate States were able to secede and arm themselves. But it also meant that the Union could arm thousands of soldiers who already knew how to shoot and how to hit their targets. But Roast, surely the Framers meant personal arms only. Um, no. Just, no. Remember that mention of plundering seas and ravaging coasts? What the framers meant was that Americans had the right to arm their ships. They believed that the right to self-defense extended to property, including merchant ships who were attacked by warships. That defense had to be conducted through the possession and use of cannons. The framers knew that unarmed merchant vessels would be vulnerable to the first warship which they encountered. Thus, the private ownership of major weapon systems served by crews of people rather than an individual was guaranteed by the Second Amendment. Since that time, we have seen a slow increase in restrictions applied to types of firearms, and yes, that has been contentious. Since the framers meant that even ship's cannons were okay, does that mean that I should still be able to buy a howitzer or a machine gun? Congress has put restrictions on these weapons, after all. Did they violate the Second Amendment when they did this? Technically, yes. But there really isn't a need for these weapons in private hands anymore. America is still the most heavily armed nation when it comes to rifles, shotguns, and pistols. The people could still defend themselves against the government if needed. And we should keep in mind that the military has a distinct bias towards maintaining freedom for the people. The oaths sworn by America's service people are to the Constitution, including the Second Amendment. So any government which ordered the military to attack their fellow Americans or to seize their privately owned firearms would see a revolt within the ranks, just as we did back in 1860 and 1861. But what about all the violence, Roast? The violence in America is a negative aspect of the current culture, not gun culture. If we are going to address it, then we need to dig down to the issues in our culture which foster violent acts and resolve them. The guns themselves are just tools. Violent people will find other tools. Ask London about the recent rise in knife and acid attacks within that city if you don't believe me. The issues which have fueled violent political actions in America recently is why I made this channel. We need to discuss those issues rationally to find real solutions to them. We need to also bear in mind that part of the reason why Japan did not invade the mainland in the United States after they destroyed our fleet in December 1941 is because they were advised by Admiral Yamamoto that in America there was a rifle behind every blade of grass. Now that's just my opinion and you don't have to agree with me. In fact, I'd love to hear what you think, so go ahead and give me a like or dislike and comment below. If you like this content and want to see more, feel free to subscribe and make sure that you ring the notification bell. New episodes of Roasted Opinions post on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. and Saturdays at noon, Central Time. Join me the last Saturday of every month for my live stream with a special guest who joins me in the kitchen. New content is coming, so watch this space.